Well, good morning, everybody. So good to be here with you guys this morning to worship, to be a part of our Momentum series here. And so in just a second, uh, my brother-in-law, Scott Hansen, is going to come up here and join me um, because we want to tell you, yeah, come on up, Scott. We want to tell you all about uh, some of the momentums where God is moving in our midst. And uh, one of those one of those places was Ram, uh, um, Ram Camp uh, about a week ago. And uh, I came back here kind of scattered and fried uh, after, a, after a short weekend with those guys, um, but Scott got to spend even more time than I did up there, and so I wanted to have him up here to share with us. Sorry, I'm scratching a lot here. Let me see if I can adjust that. I want to have him up here to share with us a little bit, so I'm going to kind of interview you today just a little bit um, uh, to, sh to share some of the stories from Ram Camp, because it was an incredible time of God moving up in the mountains of Prescott amongst young men, and uh, uh, we're always blown away by what God does uh, um, at Ram Camp every year. So um, I'm just going to ask you some questions. This is Scott Hansen, if I didn't say that before. This is my brother-in-law. He's a member of our church. He's a new dad. He's got a little, a little boy named Hunter, and, uh, um, but he has been a critical part, uh, integral part of Ram for many years now. And so uh, the, the kids love him, and, and he loves the kids, and that's why I asked him to come join us this morning. So, so Scott, what was one of those moments you will remember, like, like the fun times that will that'll be burned into your brain for a while because of what happened at Ram Camp this year? Might have been, you know. Okay. That's, it is working. Yeah. Um, One of the boys who's been coming to our Bible studies on Wednesdays, and I think this is his third Ram camp, um, is constantly uh, telling me that he's going to uh, get me out in dodgeball. <laughs> and um, the first game, um, I hit him right in the face, and that was just glorious for me. Yeah, yeah, um, it, it totally it is. Really, it taught him a lesson right away uh, that I'm not somebody to be messed with. But um, no, it's 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 all in fun, and that that kid is. Uh, that kid is an absolute joy to be around. And he's constantly um, egging me on to do stuff and challenging me to things. And I didn't actually hit him in the face. Um, but uh, it, it's just moments like that where you have, where they look forward to something all year long. And um, it's funny that, that that moment that comes for them. Because they don't, they don't ever get to go on vacation. There's no such thing as vacation for them. It's school, uh, go to the house, and then during the summertime, you stay at the house. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no vacation for them. They, they don't know what that's like. So to have Ram Camp, and it's only a three-day weekend, but to have that be there, the only thing they look forward to all year long is a big deal, and to make that uh, special for them is really important to us. And we have so much fun going up with them that I look forward to it all year long. Scott looks forward to it all year long. We yeah. start talking amongst the guys, like looking forward to what's uh, what's going to happen uh, because it's not just dodgeball. I mean, we have incredible oh conversations. We uh, have, yeah. you know, we play basketball. We play ultimate frisbee. We play frisbee golf out through the woods. All kinds of stuff, and it, and it's a blast. But yeah. it's we not have to just get in shape for it. Make no mistake, like, yeah. you have to get in shape for it. <laughs> Uh, we, we start off, you know, we, Zach and I call each other up, make sure, you know, hey, did you run a mile today? You know, yeah. three months uh, before I we... mostly talk about getting in shape for it, <laughs> and I don't really get in shape for it, but I try. Um, but it's a great thing. One of the best moments from this camp, um, one of the boys, we was talking about, they all love the dodgeball. And uh, one of the boys, we did a leaders versus boys, and this one boy who's been coming to our Bible studies, different boy, been coming to our Bible studies every Wednesday, and he has such potential to be a leader. Um, but he gets, he gets so caught up in, um, the current culture of our world and keep in mind the only adult in his life are paid to be there. So you have teachers and you have staff. And so, um, that's the culture that is raising them up. That's their moms and dads. And so, um, he has such potential to be a leader. He's such a great kid. Um, but he gets caught up in, in, in that culture. And when the people that, when the adults in his life don't care as much as, say, your, a lot of your parents care about your life, um, the next best thing to them is the kids, their peers, the kids around them. So whatever the kids they think are, are, 
whatever the kids think is cool and whatever they're doing, that's what their big boys are going to fall in line with. So he really struggles with that. We've had some really good talks, but this boy had a chance to really st stand out at this camp, and um, he led his team in a, in a comeback during dodgeball versus us that was epic. Because we mean, usually win. We the, all the leaders undefeated. like like we usually win and we did beat them the first game but the second game this kid had a comeback that was absolutely amazing he uh um he was the last one in and we have there's a rule when you catch a ball another boy gets to come back in and he caught two or three of them but the second that boy would run in we would tag him and he'd be out so it was just this one kid all the time and at one point um he he must have caught five of the dodgeballs in a row that brought his boys back in, and I mean, which is also could, sending one of the adults out could, every yeah, time. So it's a it's a two point it. swing. And so he ended up leading a comeback um, that brought multiple boys back in, and they came up with a strategy, and this and they, they ended up beating them. So it was the first time ever they beat them. So yeah. I don't, I've never been so happy in my life to lose. I'll just tell you right now, that was one of the best moments, I think, of camp that we've had ever. I mean, this this kid was just awesome. And everybody was on him, calling him the MVP of camp. And you could just see his confidence in, uh, in who he is just, just boiling to the surface. Man, he was just beaming the whole rest of the week. And that Bible study last week, he was just all smiles, just – Fantastic. And, and for, for young men especially, it's really important to have those victories. Even if they're just physical victories, something like that, where it's, it's, it's winning at a sport. But, ladies, we really need to win. Like, boys and men need to win at stuff. And it's, it needs to be a physical win. You have to know what you're made of. You have to have your, test, your, your, your strength tested. You have to have your endurance tested, your mental ability tested. And it, and it's when that's tested and when you prevail and they get a win like that, that's when you start seeing, you know, you start seeing little boys becoming older and start being more mature when they realize that they have the ability to go out and conquer. Mm -hmm. They have the ability to fight fights. They have the ability to conquer the world. They have the ability to, to, to take control of the situation. And when all, you're, when all you do is get told that you're bad and you just sit at home and you, you, get told, you go to class and you get told to sit down and stop being obnoxious and all the other things, and then and you don't have anybody in your life to teach you how to do stuff. Like None of these boys have anybody in their life to teach them how to play basketball. They love it, but they're all bad at it. <laughs> because He's in an out-of-shape guy like me he can beat them. Two, 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 two five-year-old out-of-shape guys can, can beat them most of the time. And it, but they, so they don't, have, they don't like losing. And when your life is just constantly loss after loss after loss, and nobody teaches you how to win or how to be good at something so you can win on your own, you, they're, they're hopeless. Most of that's the, that's just it. Most of them are hopeless. They have no idea what to believe in or what to have hope in in their future. And so that boy winning that dodgeball game and winning being the, the, the MVP of camp, that was a really, really big step for him to becoming a better man in the future. Mm -hmm. That moment, we, we both ran over to him and like basically like hugged him up off the ground. And he was in, he happened to be in my small group this year. We, we kind of like split up all the boys in the small groups for discussion time after Scott gave some messages this year. And uh, he was so quiet, like, you know, almost afraid to speak up and, and almost afraid to process his own thoughts, I think, like to own up to how he felt or thought about the world. And after that win, like the floodgates opened up in our small group discussion. After that win and the confidence it brought for him, the, the, the love he felt in being appreciated for, what, for who God made him to be because he's a natural athlete, uh, he opens up and, and we had an incredible discussion in our next small group time. And so it was, it was really amazing. Yeah. Well, I got one more question for you, Scott. I, I want to steer you in this direction. How has RAM, RAM camp, but also RAM in general, impacted your life and your walk with God? What time do we have to be done today? <laughs> I can scratch the message. Um, Let's just go with this. <laughs> um, boy, that's a... Just tell us a story. So, how has it affected me? 
So I talk about how important wins are for, for young men and uh, how winning even a tiny battle helps lead them to their next battle and their next victory. And <coughs> with this, when we first started doing this Ram stuff, it was mostly just a, how can we get these, how can we teach these boys to be, to live on their own? We started off by doing skills days once a month where we'd teach them uh, how to do bicycle maintenance, vehicle maintenance, how to fill out a job application, how to separate your clothes when you wash them so they don't just go in the wash because that's what they do at the houses. Everything they own just goes in the wash at one time, gets put on high heat, high temp, boom, done. That's it. And so a lot of them, you know, um, it's simple things like that. Uh, how to find an apartment, how to, how to do a job interview. That's what we started out doing. And as we started doing this, uh, we realized that all we were doing is trying to put paint on a rusty car. I mean, you can call it what you want, but all we're trying to do is just sprinkle on a little bit of here's how to be an adult without actually building the foundation of what that actually means. And for myself at the time, when we started doing this, uh, we decided that um, we wanted to be more involved with their lives and try to really reach out and help them. And there's a very popular Christian saying um, where uh, it's just plant the seed, right? I've heard it my entire life. Oh, you just got to plant the seed. Oh, well, I talked to that guy for five minutes. I, got, I just planted the seed. And I think that is a... I think that is the worst way to look at Christianity. I think if you're going to be somebody who's going to call yourself a Christian and all you're going to do is Johnny be Johnny Appleseed out there tossing seeds around and not really paying attention to where they're going, and yeah, some land in the, in the thorns and some get covered by wheat and some land on good soil and some land on, on bad soil and some land in the rocks, they get killed by the sun, right? So we, we think, oh, we got to do out there is, is throw a bunch of seeds around and then one's land in good soil will be fine. And... Uh, I just think that's such a cop out. I think that's just, just a, it's an awful way to, to, to view your relationship with God is like, well, I did my best. I threw some seeds out there. Um, and so we didn't, I didn't want to just get one time a month to be able to, you know, feel good about myself about throwing a seed and go on the rest of my day or go on the rest of my month. Um, I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted to actually plant the seed. I wanted to water it. I wanted to see it grow. I wanted to see it bloom. And so we started doing these Bible studies, and that became, that just became my kind of mission, right? Uh, not that I, not that we, um, <laughs> not that we feel like we're making that big of a difference. Trust me, we, everybody says, oh, we're making a difference, we're making a difference. I gotta be honest with you, well, most days it doesn't feel like we're making a difference. Uh, we get two hours a week to rewrite um, the cultural code that has been put into them all their lives and all week long. And most of the time, it's, it's really just like feels like a losing battle. And so where it has changed me is it has um, helped me really – these kids come up with a lot of questions that are really, really tough questions to answer. And in order to answer those questions, in order to, to con stay consistent with my mess with my message of – not just planting a seed, but watering the seed and growing the seed, is that i gotta, I got to find the answer to a lot of these questions. So my relationship with God has deepened. Uh, my knowledge of the Bible has, has ex expanded in a lot. I mean, I think I've listened to the entire Old Testament on audiobook already. I'm still working my way through the New Testament. Um, and just reading and just being in Scripture all the time because they'll ask a question, well, sure enough, if I'm doing my job, and I'm in the, in the Bible, and I'm reading, I guarantee you, one of these boys is going to ask me a question that has something to do with that particular story or message that, we were, that I was just reading about. And when I'm not doing that, when I go weeks at a time without getting into the Bible and not prepping for, prepping for our Wednesdays, you can see it. The boys are rowdy. They're not paying attention. I'm frustrated. It's just not a good, it's not a good thing. And so that's, that's on me. And so it's really helped me be a leader in that sense of um, really relying on God to just um, reach
reshape who I am and my beliefs so that I can better serve uh, the people and, the, and, and, and especially serve, serve these boys in this, in this particular community. Um, I'm not gonna lie to you, a lot of it, a lot of it is, is feels like losses. Um, we, ha we have some really good wins. Um, there's uh, one of my favorite, one of my favorite stories I'll tell you is that um, there's one boy, um, his name is, oh gosh, I'm not gonna say his name. <laughs> uh, He's from, from what we can gather, El Salvador, from Chile, somewhere south of the border, beyond Mexico. Um, and uh, he has nobody here. Um, if you've seen on the news, all those boys coming across on trains and all of the, yeah, he was one of them. And uh, he's been in our Bible study for about a year. And uh, earlier this year, he, uh, we, I asked the boys what they wanted to do in our Bible studies, and they said they wanted to read the Bible directly. Like, you want to read right out of the Bible. No more watching videos. No more, I want to read right out of the Bible. So we started reading. We started right there in Matthew. We started reading all the exciting stuff. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't know if I've ever said more than a few words to this kid. I said a lot, well, I said a lot to him, but I don't think he's ever said more than, you know, hi to me. I didn't even know he spoke English, to be honest with you. And uh, about our second month into reading Matthew, I asked if anybody wanted to read, and he raised his hand, and he read an entire verse. It was very broken English, but he, he read the entire thing, and he volunteered. And that to me, that was, that was amazing. I, first of all, I had no idea he could read. I had no idea he could read English. I had no idea he had the confidence in himself to be able to do that. And so that was, well, number one, it was very humbling for me for assuming I knew who this boy was. Uh, but for him to have the, the confidence to say, hey, I'm going to try this. And then, and then nobody's, to think that he could do that and not be worried about anybody making fun of him uh, for not being able to, to read or not him not knowing English or him... Um, you know, not understanding what we're talking about. I think that that's a giant win. That he has the confidence in himself to know that he can come to our Bible study and not be made fun of. That's a big win for me. And so um, that's probably been my best moment in our Bible study so far. We've had some really, really good, really good moments with these boys. Um, but I'll be honest, I. I it, we have more boys coming, wanting to come to Bible study now than I can, than I can manage. Um, I, I drive to two houses and pick boys up. I've got a Toyota Highlander that seats five comfortably. Uh, we'll seat six really skinny ones. Uh, <laughs> and um, so yeah. there's no cops in here, right? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I got to sneak an extra skinny one in there, yeah. you know, and it, I'm fitting, you know, a suburban's worth of kids in my small little Highlander. And, you know, my, my mom goes to pick up the other boys and, and the same kind of thing. Like we just have to cut it off. Like, I'm sorry, yeah. I can't, I can't take all of you guys. Um, so mm -hmm. we have a lot of boys that want to come and, um, which is, which is an awesome feeling and, and, and telling them no is really not, is, is a, is a, is a, heart-wrenching thing to tell them every Wednesday, too. So we could really use some help if there's anybody out there who wants to volunteer. Um, the, uh, like I said, we're, we're not, we, we're not trying to rescue them. I had a friend tell me one time that he grew up in foster care, and I asked him, I said, well, how do we rescue these boys? And he says, you can't, you can't rescue them. They've already lost. They've already, they, you can't rescue them from what's already happened to them. And I thought when we started doing this, we could come in here like Superman, swing them, save them from falling, and put them back somewhere and be like, you're safe now. Good luck. And um, that it, it's not the way it works. They've, they've already been injured. All we can do is heal them and then teach them how to hopefully not get injured or not make mistakes that will injure themselves, but also how to accept the fact that other people are going to injure them. There's just nothing you can do about it. Um, and there's every week I have two or three boys that want to talk to me privately about something. 
and I can see another at least two or three that are going through something that I can't, I can't, I don't have time to go out and talk to because I'm trying to deal with the other boys. I have boys that just really, they just really want attention, so I try to give them attention, and I have the boys that want to talk to me about something, and then I got these boys over here that are clearly going through something that are distressed, and I can't, I don't have time to talk to them. In the meantime, I got to go outside because there's always at least two or th- one or two kids that wants to go outside and try to sneak a vape in while they're bringing stuff. So yeah, and yeah, sorry, I go on, but um, but the the thing that Scott does, if I can just brag on you for a second, yeah, is he invests his life into people invest his life into others like like you you hear about like okay there's challenges and sometimes it doesn't feel like there's a win or whatever but what he has done is he's put himself in a position in life where he is standing in somebody else's story and that is an image of the gospel like living out the gospel i'm almost getting goosebumps saying it because jesus christ stepped out off of his throne in heaven to step into our stories to walk alongside of us, to help us process the hurt because we live in a sinful world and and help us make better decisions going forward so that maybe those hurts don't happen again in the same way. And and so the reason I asked Scott to come up here today is because this is discipleship. This is a beautiful example of somebody who's all in, whose life has been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see... We, we kind of have known each other for a long time. We actually knew each other as kids long before we became brother-in-laws. And, and we were friends before we were family and all that kind of stuff. And there was a time when Scott and I both just loved to play. All right? We both were like the outdoorsy guys, and we wanted to run off to the woods and do our thing. And then on the journey, and God has taken us each on different journeys, but on the journey, God got a hold of our hearts and said, no, you're, you're meant to invest your life into people, into people. Go make disciples of all nations. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it doesn't feel like there's a lot of wins, but the win comes in the well done, good and faithful servant. The well done, like we're living for eternity, not just for, you know, how many mountains I can hike anymore, because that was where I was going before. Right, <laughs> or, or, or you know, how how far I can paddle in a canoe or whatever. Like that was that was me living for myself, and now we're living for eternity. And so I want to yes, thank you, Scott, for more. coming. One can more just, thing. One yeah. more thing before you start clapping. Um, I, what you said there about uh, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. The the parable of the talents, right? God gives you talents, and He expects you to use them. And maybe, for me, the, the talents that I thought I had were supposed to work in the corporate world, were supposed to make me go out and, and be successful at jobs and, and, and whatever career I wanted to choose. And that, that, wasn't, that, that didn't work out for me. And so I thought that maybe my talents were useless. And then God brought this Bible study and these boys in our lives. And, I, and, and now I'm using my talents to help change their lives. And for me, mm-hmm. when, when you know, it says that, well done, good and faithful servant, when I die and I go meet our maker and I go see Jesus for the first time and he says, what did you do with the talent I gave you? I hope I have a decent answer. So, yeah, thank you. I think you have a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Scott. <laughs> Let's give him a round of applause. So, uh, I I wanted to share this with you guys because God is moving and we want to be a church that joins God where he's moving. And so if like you don't have a place, right? Like if God hasn't put a ministry on your heart to be a part of, this is an option for you. Uh, Scott and my mother-in-law Renee are going to be out at the table in the lobby. They're members of our church, but they also are highly, highly invested in this ministry. And you guys can be a part of it too. The many of the members of our church already are invested in this ministry, but uh, some of the needs of this ministry right now are men and women, but especially men is what they need right today, who are willing to come alongside other young men, who are willing to mentor or lead a Bible study, these young guys. When, when six guys are trying to get to Scott after, after small group, there could be five more guys there standing alongside him who are willing to talk to these guys one-on-one and spend time with them, or guys who are willing to to go 
do life alongside these young men. And so mentors is a huge need of this ministry. Um, uh, 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 Bible study leaders is a huge need of this ministry because we don't, we don't just take them to camp and plant that seed of here's the gospel. Oh, great, you accepted Christ. Nice knowing you. We'll see you in heaven. But we walk alongside these kids through life. We don't want to leave spiritual infants abandoned out there. And so we walk alongside them through life, through this ministry, um, because they don't have access to, like, even attending a church every Sunday the way we do. They don't have that same kind of access and freedom. Their life is dictated for them at this point in time. And so we want to stand in that gap for them. And so uh, we need those kind of men and women in their lives. Also, uh, if you'd like to support RAM financially, of course, you can do that as well. The, you can talk to them out there in the lobby. And a financial need of RAMs right now is more of the, on the transportation side. And so uh, RAM is praying for a 15-passenger van in order to transport more of these young men. RAM already does have a minivan, but then we're using a whole lot of uh, personal vehicles all the time to shuttle these these kids to small groups and Bible studies and things like that. And so as uh, uh, transportation options open up, it allows us to take care of a lot, a lot more of these young men and, um, and uh, uh, start more of these small groups and that kind of stuff. All right? So thank you, Scott, for, for sharing with us this morning. Um, it's inspiring to hear, and we burned up most of the time for the message, so let me just uh, uh, wrap that up, and, we're <laughs> um, and uh, we'll wrap up the message here in just a moment, but let me leave you guys with a thought, okay? When, if we're joining God in where he's moving, if, if, we're, if we're looking for, for where, where he's changing the world and we're stepping into that story, we have to recognize our marching orders. And so last week, we started talking about the Great Commission again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hammer this at you guys over the next few years. Like, the Great Commission is our marching orders. It is your life purpose if you didn't know it, because that's what Jesus spoke to his disciples. He said, go, well, let's, let's look right at it. We pull it up on the screen, Matthew 28. We're going to start in verse 19 here. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Therefore, go and make disciples. Don't go and leave disciples. Don't go and plant some seeds that become disciples. No, discipleship is, is an act of following Jesus in a way that you invite somebody else on that journey so that they start looking more and more like him and start following him as well. Not that they're following us. They're not our disciples. They're his. And, and so I want to be a church that makes disciples. We do this through small groups in our church. Like this fall, you'll hear it coming up where we'll, we'll be talking about men's small groups, women's small groups, uh, um, uh, a ministry called Regen. We're going to start talking about like a whole bunch of small groups. We do it just through relationships of getting to know people alongside people as we worship together. We do it through serving in places like RAM or when we've been serving our community with produce on, on Saturday mornings on the fourth Saturday of the month where we come and serve together. We do it through serving our kids and children's ministry over here or our students or that kind of stuff. Like we walk alongside each other. We do life together. That's why the, the church is often referred to as a family, like a family of faith. And so go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. We're going to get to that in a second. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12, or 3, verse 12, sorry, it's going to take you there today. There's this passage, and I'm going to summarize it for you really fast. There's this passage that's talking about Moses. If you remember that guy, he's the one with the Ten Commandments. He went up to the mountain to come back down with the Ten Commandments. If you don't remember, before he did that, God appeared to the whole nation of Israel. Like the mountain was thundering, and all the people were lined up along the face of the mountain, and they were afraid of his glory. They were afraid of the presence of God. And so they said, Moses, you go as our, as our representative. 
And he went up there and he came down and his face was just glowing with the glory of God, like emanating in a way that it sort of scared people. So he put on a veil. And in this passage, I want you guys to go read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, this upcoming week. Go, re- go read it. This passage is talking all about how there was always something between us and God whether it was our sin that separated us from God or even then when we were trying to approach God, there was, the, there was this veil, this something between us. Now it's a, a law and a priesthood. There was always something between us and God until what Christ did at the cross, until our sins could be forgiven once and for all, until we had a high priest that could bring us once again into the presence of God. And so at one time, people were afraid of his presence And now it's accessible to all of us is what this scripture says through the Holy Spirit. And so we're celebrating that here this morning through baptism, like the, like the great commission says, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. And so in just a moment, we're going to watch a baptism video and we are going to worship with another song. And then And then a young man who grew up at this church and and is now becoming a father himself is is going to be baptized up here. And and we're going to celebrate that together as a family because this is what God does. He gives us new life. And so let me remind you what this divine drama playing out is. Baptism is, is an act of us recognizing that we are on God's team. It's like the act of putting on a jersey or, or taking a vow and putting on that wedding ring. I, have, I, I belong to him. I belong to the one who has set me free. And, and so this represents us dying and being buried as we're lowered into the water. And then us rising new, redeemed, reconciled, forgiven of our sins. And restored to a right relationship with God. Right? Sin says we were once dead, or the scripture says that because of our sin, we were once dead. We were dead in our transgressions. And this symbolizes our forgiveness through what Jesus did at the cross and his resurrection. And so we're going to celebrate that here today. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And he made a way. He made a way through his death and through his burial and through his resurrection for us to be forgiven. All right. All right, Josh, come on up here. Roberto, come on over here, too. This is Joshua Butler. He uh, grew up around this church and uh, has relationships with probably many of you. And uh, he accepted Christ about two years ago, but decided just recently that uh, he wanted to publicly declare that in front of everybody. And so he was going to come and be baptized today. I'll hold the mic if you want to stand back here. It's going to the extra height's going to give you some help. <laughs> so, Roberto's going to, this is Roberto Chavez. Uh, he's going to read uh, scripture for us. So I wanted to share a little bit out of uh, Colossians chapter 3. And it says, you are raised from death with Christ. So aim what is in heaven, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Your old sinful self, Josh, has died, and your new life is kept with Christ in God. Christ is your life. When he comes again, you will share in his glory. You have begun to live the new life. In your new life, you are being made new. You are becoming like the one who made you. This new life brings you the true knowledge of God. Josh, God has chosen you and made you his holy people. He loves you, so always do these things. Show mercy to others. Be kind, humble, gentle, and patient. Amen. Josh, I'm going to pray for you real quick, and, and, then, and then we'll dump you, okay? Father God, we just thank you so much for the decision Joshua has made, not only to, to follow you, but to de- now to declare you before others. And Father, we know that this is a, this is a step in the journey. This is the beginning uh, of a long adventure ahead, and, and so we thank you that we, 
your, your family, your people get to walk alongside this young man as he, as he embarks on this journey into eternity. Father, we, we pray today that you would just pour out your blessings, blessings of, of growth, blessings of challenge, but blessings of peace and joy on Joshua during his journey, Lord. And we pray that your spirit today would come upon him in powerful ways to renew who he is from the inside out so that he would, so that he would represent you well, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Joshua, today, because of your proclamation as Jesus, as your Lord and Savior, today we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, climb on out of there and come up front here. I want to pray over you one more time. All right, anybody who wants to join me, family, friends, come on up here. Uh, stay right here on the, on the rug, that way you can catch some of that water. Yeah, get in here, Mikey. Come on over. Joshua's young son, Alonzo. Special that he gets to be here today. Father God, I just want to pray protection over this family. Today we know that there is a host of angels celebrating in the heavenly realms because of the decisions that Joshua has made. And Father, we know that that you are going to build him up to lead this young family. And so, Father, we pray protection over their family. We know that the, the enemy doesn't like what's happened here today, that the enemy doesn't like your name being raised on high, and that, that, that Joshua has picked a side in this epic battle that rages all around us. And so, Father, we pray that you would clad him with your armor, that you would protect this warrior of yours, and that as he goes out from here, Lord, he would keep his eyes on you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. All right. That's going to conclude our celebration this morning, our, our service here. And so uh, please hug on this guy. It'll help dry him off. Um, <laughs> please hug on this guy and celebrate with him as you guys go. Uh, you guys can keep celebrating and praising God. We have four more baptisms coming yet today during our second service. So give God a round of applause for that as he's working in the lives of others.